It's the mid-1980s, the height of the drug war, and a small plane is headed towards Okeechobee. On board are two men and 350 kilograms of pure Colombian cocaine. They're on their way to a ranch in the rural north part of Okeechobee County when they realize that they're being chased. In pursuit is a United States Custom Citation plane. The pilot desperately starts evasive maneuvers, trying to lose the plane tracking them. They dive to only 25 feet off the ground, flying just above the Florida Turnpike. At one point, tilting the plane's wings to fly in between light poles. They reach the cattle ranch in Okeechobee and have to perform a crash landing. Part of the tail snapped off as the plane bounced along the rough pasture. Once down, the man who owned the ranch helped them unload the cocaine. Then, all three began dismantling the plane, burying it in various spots throughout the property. The men are part of a group that would go on to be known as the Okeechobee Eight, a influential set of good old boys that smuggled over $100 million worth of cocaine into Okeechobee. Growing up in this town, the Okeechobee Eight were always spoken of in the same kind of tones one would use when talking about the Illuminati or some Skull and Bones secret society. It almost became this urban legend, this secret group that ran things in Okeechobee really ran things behind the scenes, a group you didn't want to cross. Though they avoided the customs plane, what the men don't know is that their entire smuggling ring is only a year away from being unraveled by federal agents at the DEA. And the revelation of who exactly was behind the massive amount of drugs coming into the area leaves the entire Okeechobee community in shock and catches the attention of the White House. We explore the story of that revelation and its after effects in today's episode of True Oki. By the mid-1980s, everyone in South Florida knows that someone is helping smuggle drugs into the area. In 1983, boats were used to smuggle marijuana into Everglades City, a small fishing village 80 miles west of Miami. The resulting DEA bus in that town ended with the arrest of nearly 80% of the adult male population over a three-year time span. But now, the main drug the Freds are interested in stopping is cocaine. This is George Bush, vice president under Reagan from 1980 to 1988, and president from 1988 to 1992. All of us agree that the gravest domestic threat facing our nation today is drugs. Turn on the evening news or pick up the morning paper, and you'll see what some Americans know just by stepping out their front door. Our most serious problem today is cocaine. Who's responsible? He formed the South Florida Drug Task Force, the most expensive drug enforcement operation in the nation's history up to that time. The task force had one goal in mind, stop the flow of drugs into South Florida. By the mid-80s, small airplanes are the preferred method for smugglers. Cocaine was carried in small planes that could fly below U.S. radar and then land on dirt roads in South Florida. Katrina Elskin moved to Okeechobee in 1986 to take the editor position at the local newspaper, the Okeechobee News. But even before arriving in Okeechobee, she was well aware of the widespread use of small planes in the drug smuggling trade. Um, There was a a woman I interviewed in LaBelle. She was kind of funny. She lived out in the woods, 
and one day she's walking in the woods and she saw a plane and she waved at it and it dipped its wings at her and and she waved again and she got kind of in an open area and it's and it kind of flew down low and oh this was exciting and then it dropped this package and she goes and looks and it was drugs apparently they thought she was signaling them that she was the and she had no idea and then uh, afterwards she said she was really harassed um, and, and she got to be afraid and she moved because apparently whoever was supposed to be <laughs> receiving those drugs came after her so uh, and, and this was just you know this poor little retired woman who'd gone for a walk in the wrong place one day. So the community wasn't surprised that someone was helping smuggle drugs into the area. It, I mean it seemed pretty obvious but no one could have predicted who exactly it was. Until one October morning, when a press conference at the Okeechobee Library changed everything. On October 16, 1986, Okeechobee County Sheriff John Collier and United States Attorney Leon Keller held a press conference and dropped a bombshell. Keller announced that he was indicting 29 people on a slew of drug charges, including conspiracy to import cocaine, possession with intent to distribute, and more. Listed in the indictment were well-known and respected members of the Okeechobee community, a who's who of local businessmen and cattle ranchers. Owner of the Brahmin Movie Theater in Okeechobee, Richard Hales, restaurant owner, Johnny Seville, Car salesman Arthur Betty, rancher Alton Paget, B.L. Underhill, Jeff Underhill, Clyde Lewis, and former Okeechobee County Sheriff Deputy Tim Grant were just some of the names in the indictment, as well as Merritt Island airplane broker William Sisk and Vero Beach residents Earl Bowers, Walter Groves, and Lester Peterson. It was a massive announcement and the biggest drug bust in Okeechobee up to that point. But it was pretty shocking that he, they had this big long list of people who were being arrested and then the names were people that even though I hadn't been here very long, I was recognizing, you know, here's this person who owns a restaurant and here's the person who runs the theater and a rancher and, you know, like, wait a minute, these are like the pillars of the community and they're being charged with drug trafficking. So, that you know, that was pretty shocking for the whole town. People kind of had the attitude, oh, well, it's outsiders who bring drugs in, mm -hmm. you know, it's not the, the good people who live here, they wouldn't have anything to do with that. It's, it's all the outsiders. And it was really a wake up call when suddenly here's, you know, people who I had been, I had been in, to meetings at that restaurant and I had been to the movies, you know, and I had visited these businesses and then to find out that the people who own the businesses were involved in the drug trafficking was, was pretty much a shock. According to the indictment, the conspiracy began in 1984 when V.L. Underhill offered Arthur Betty $200,000 if he could provide a pilot and co-pilot to fly an airplane filled with 250 kilograms of cocaine from Columbia to Florida. Then, in July of 1984, Richard Hales, Lacey Batten, and John Feller agreed to equally share the profits from smuggling cocaine and to share the cost of purchasing a plane to transport it. Four Colombians provided the first plane, which was flown to a ranch owned by Leslie Sauls in Okeechobee, where the cocaine was then unloaded by Underhill and delivered to another handler in Miami. After that shipment, the Florida organizers purchased several aircraft of their own, outfitting them with long-range fuel tanks and removing the seating to make room for more cocaine. The group would offer ranchers between $10,000 to $60,000 to look the other way while they landed planes on their property. The operation smuggled cocaine into the area on nine different flights, with the wholesale value of drugs transported estimated to be $100 million. Keller thanked Okeechobee County Sheriff John Collier for working with the Vice President's Task Force stating that the bust wouldn't have been possible without communication between agencies. All this news hit like a shockwave in Okeechobee. Business and community leaders being involved with drug smuggling, it made people feel disillusioned. 
It's hard to have faith in the institutions of society when this kind of corruption becomes apparent. And that's when something unimaginable happened. In the early morning hours of November 10th, 1986, Okeechobee County Sheriff John Collier was found dead in his bedroom with a gunshot wound to his forehead. The death of an elected official only a few weeks after the announcement of the drug indictment was pretty startling, especially when that man played a key role in making those indictments happen. Sheriff Collier was alone the night before he was found dead. His wife, Mary, had spent the night of November 9th at her sister's house. She came home early the next morning at around 7 a.m. and went to the bedroom and shook her husband's foot, telling him it was time to get up. When he didn't respond, she pulled back the drapes that were covering the windows to let some light in. And that's when she saw him, lying on his back, with a gunshot wound about two inches above his eyes near the center of his forehead. She ran out of the room and called for help. With the sheriff recently helping break up a smuggling ring worth hundreds of millions of dollars, some in the community wondered if this made him a target, and if he was murdered because of it. However, the medical examiner, Leonard Walker, concluded that the death was a suicide. The gun found lying at the sheriff's neck, a Smith & Wesson Model 36, had blood on the inside and outside of the barrel, meaning it was pressed against his forehead when the trigger was pulled. But the medical examiner declaring the death a suicide didn't stop rumors, and it didn't stop people from speculating about what happened. It also didn't help that there were some questionable decisions made by law enforcement at the crime scene. Despite being an active crime scene, the house was not closed off to protect evidence at the location. Multiple friends, neighbors, relatives moved freely throughout the scene. It appears since responding officers assumed it was a suicide, the initial investigation wasn't as thorough. basic law enforcement practice across the country is to treat all deaths as homicides and require the first arriving officer to secure the scene and begin a crime scene log recording to track all persons coming and going from the scene. But this wasn't done. Another head-scratching decision? All the bedding, sheets, and pillows that the sheriff was lying on when he was shot were taken from the scene and burned, meaning no blood splatter analysis could ever be done. Just baffling. Another question is, why would the sheriff commit suicide? He didn't leave a note. Officials at the time speculated it was because of his health. Collier had respiratory and sinus problems, but no one said he seemed depressed about it and it didn't appear to hinder his job as a law enforcement officer. Still, the community loved the sheriff, and his death took an emotional toll. A thousand people in the small town were estimated to have gathered for his funeral. Hundreds of donated flowers lined the walkway at Buxton Funeral Home. Now I know for you, it's hard to really know what these people were like. So, to give you a better sense of who Sheriff Collier was as a person, and why people liked him, I thought I'd share a story that I found while researching this episode. Back in 1981, Collier had just been elected for the fourth time as sheriff in Okeechobee. That's when the sheriff's office gets a call about a man having a mental breakdown at a local convenience store. Collier responds to the call, and when he arrives at the store, he sees a man holding the store clerk hostage. The man is pointing a rifle at the woman's head. The clerk has this look of absolute terror on her face. So obviously, first priority 
get her out of that situation. Officers begin negotiation with the suspect. And in the midst of that negotiation, Sheriff Collier convinces him to let the cashier go free and to take him as hostage instead. Now, amazingly, this works. So the cashier is let free. Sheriff Collier goes into the store, unarmed, and takes her spot. The sheriff sat with a loaded rifle pointed at him for two hours as negotiators tried to reason with the suspect. Eventually, one of the negotiators was able to grab the suspect's rifle and end the standoff. Afterwards, when he was asked about this incident, Collier admitted that he was a nervous wreck the entire time that rifle was pointed at him. But, he said, he viewed it as his job to take on that risk, not the poor woman working at the convenience store. It was his job, because he was the one who's elected sheriff. It really kind of demonstrates why the guy was so well liked. That's who the community was saying goodbye to at the funeral home that day. Collier's death had happened only three weeks after the press conference announcing the indictments of the drug smuggling ring. And the trial for those cases was about to start. Of the 29 people listed in the indictment, eight went on to face a jury in this 1987 trial. Richard Hales, Earl Bowers, Alton Paget, Lester Peterson, V.L. Underhill, Jeff Underhill, Jose Albanez, and Bob Mormon. The rest either pleaded guilty to avoid a trial or remain fugitives from the law. Assistant U.S. Attorney James McAdams called the Okeechobee 8 trial one of the best drug trafficking cases in the United States. And Vice President George Bush was said to have a keen interest in the trial. At the trial, the government laid out the conspiracy between the group, with some of the men that pleaded guilty taking the stand to reveal the inner workings of how the smuggling operation worked. Defense lawyers for the Okeechobee 8 attack the credibility of those who had turned against their clients, calling them liars and criminals who were trying to wriggle their way out of a stiffer jail term. Prosecutors pointed out that in order to prove a criminal conspiracy, you have to talk to some criminals who took part in the conspiracy. Arthur Betty was one of the men who pleaded guilty to the charges and was something of a star witness for the prosecution. He laid out the inner workings of the group and how they managed to smuggle over 2,500 kilograms of drugs into Okeechobee. That's about 5,500 pounds of cocaine. The government's case was pretty thorough. That plane that crashed into the ranch in Okeechobee was found. One of the members who turned informants told the DEA where the group had buried the plane. And the mangled remnants of its fuselage were actually brought to court and set in front of the jury. The Okeechobee 8 were found guilty and given a range of sentences from 9 years all the way up to 35 years in prison. As the Okeechobee 8 trial wrapped up, there was still something not sitting right about what happened to Sheriff Collier. Collier was given credit at the trial by prosecutors for being a key component in bringing the smuggling ring down, and his sudden suicide still hung in the air. I had met the sheriff, and in fact, um... One of his relatives worked at the newspaper. I, I think she was a niece, or a, you know, I don't, may have been once removed or something. But um, everyone was very shocked, and she told me that um, the family, as far as she's concerned, they didn't believe that he would have kill, killed himself um, because she said, you know, his health had been improving lately, and you know, the the alleged reason for his depression was his poor health. They just didn't buy it. There, there were things very odd from the beginning in that. Um, they were immediately saying he killed himself before there was any investigation. They were destroying evidence before the, the state cops even got there. They were taking things out and burning them. Even though I was not that experienced with crime reporting at the time, I knew that was unusual. In 1987, Sheriff Collier's son, John Austin Collier, asked for the investigation into his father's death be reopened claiming that the original investigation was incomplete and substandard. But the newly appointed sheriff in Okeechobee, O.L. Wallerson, disagreed, 
saying that he was not aware of any evidence that would justify reopening the investigation. John Austin Collier said he believed his father's death was a homicide and that he was 99 and two-thirds percent sure that his father did not commit suicide. John Austin requested a copy of the investigative report of his father's death. Because the investigation was closed, it was required to be released by Florida Public Records Law. But still, John Austin was refused. Those refusals continued until April of 1987, when Assistant State Attorney Edward Miller obtained a copy of the Collier death investigation. But then, Miller was ordered by State Attorney Bruce Colton not to release the report to John Austin. Colton said that the order not to release the report came from Okeechobee Sheriff O.L. Rollerson. Rollerson was the first responding member of law enforcement to arrive at the scene after Sheriff Collier's wife, Mary, found him dead. Adding to the rumors and speculation going on at the time was the fact that in February of 1986, Sheriff Collier had actually demoted Rollerson down from his chief deputy position to captain. The demotion stemmed from an incident where Rollerson had showed up drunk and off-duty to a bar and tried to shut the place down for being open too late. Sheriff Collier at the time called it an unfortunate incident and unprofessional, but went on to say that Rollerson was an asset to the department and a good man. In 1996, 10 years after the events of the Okeechobee 8, Assistant State Attorney Edward Miller, the man who had tried to get the death investigation of Collier to his son, John Austin, ran for sheriff himself, and he defeated O.L. Rollerson to take the position. After he won, he was asked by John Austin to make a complete and thorough investigation of his father's death. Even though it was 10 years post-mortem, Sheriff Miller agreed to look into the death and began a new investigation. In January of 1997, Sheriff Miller discovered that the entire case file regarding Carlier's death, including pictures and negatives from the crime scene, was missing from the Okeechobee County Sheriff's Office. Nine months later, the original case files were recovered, intact. Former Okeechobee County Sheriff's Office Major Ed Flynn brought them to the Sheriff's Office and explained that he didn't realize that he had taken them home. Sheriff Miller assigned Detective Marshall Murrows to the investigation, with the bottom line of the assignment being to determine if physical evidence of the scene could credibly support the hypothesis of murder. Over the next three years, Murrows investigated circumstances regarding Collier's life and background. It was found that prior to his death, Sheriff Collier had passed information related to major smuggling operations to the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. But credible and admissible evidence to prove the death was something other than a suicide couldn't be found. And a lot of that stemmed from the inadequate initial investigation. First, it appeared no single entity was in charge of the investigation. FDLE Regional and Director E.J. Piccolo said that O.L. Rollerson was in charge, but Rollerson said that FDLE was in charge. Since the sheets, pillows, and bedding were immediately destroyed by officers at the crime scene, no blood splatter analysis could be done or could ever be done. According to Ron K. Wright, director of the Division of Forensic Pathology at the Miami School of Medicine, given that there was blood splatter on the outside and inside of the barrel of the gun, there should have also been blood splatter on the sheriff's hands. Evidence of that would prove without a doubt that Collier committed suicide. But no blood was noted by the medical examiner, and no close-up photographs were taken of Sheriff Collier's hands and arms. Another issue raised the angle of the gunshot entry wound indicated the weapon was held in Collier's left hand, but Collier was right-handed. 
In early 1987, a juvenile inmate at the jail approached a deputy and told him that he was afraid for his life. The juvenile said he was at the residence when they, quote, killed John Collier and he was now requesting to speak to an FBI agent. But later, when the state attorney's office was investigating the claim and interviewed that same juvenile, they found that his information was totally inaccurate. And in a subsequent interview, the juvenile admitted that everything he had previously said was false. Ten years later, in 1997, this same individual gave a sworn taped statement to Sheriff Miller, saying that he and a few others had gone to Collier's house the night before his death. The others went inside while he remained outside, and he heard a gunshot. Unfortunately, because the original case file was missing for much of 1997, Investigators didn't know that this individual had been interviewed before and found to be unreliable. In a subsequent interview, the individual failed a polygraph test. Investigators also couldn't track down the origin of the gun that killed Collier. That's Smith & Wesson Model 36. Okeechobee County Sheriff Deputy Gary Hargraves said he didn't believe the gun belonged to Collier. For the last four years of his life, Hargraves cleaned the sheriff's guns. And he said he never saw it. Detective Murrows had no luck tracing the gun in the new investigation. Ultimately, with the evidence available, the new investigation couldn't prove that the sheriff had been murdered. So where do you go from there? I mean, they couldn't exactly. investigate either any more because they didn't have any evidence mm -hmm. to process. You know, yeah. um, they couldn't check blood splatter. They couldn't process all the, all the new things they have that they could do. Now yeah. the evidence was gone. It had already been destroyed. All they could do was look at the photos they had and, and give their best judgment based on the photos they saw. Mm -hmm which were consistent with suicide, mm -hmm. but they couldn't say for sure mm -hmm. because they didn't have, they couldn't rule out that it wasn't because yeah. they just didn't have the evidence to process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it's a shame it wasn't processed at the time. It, mm -hmm. uh, people would have slept better knowing yeah. one way or the other what had happened. And, and looking back on it now, I mean, maybe we're more interested in, in, in crime scene investigation, you know, this mm -hmm. is this is back in the 80s. It's a mm -hmm. long time ago. They didn't do a lot of the techniques that they do now. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can't tell you why mm -hmm. the, the sheriff's office didn't wait for FDLE, mm -hmm. why they went. I mean, I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, did, did they think they were doing the best they could at the time? I, I can't tell you. Still, due to the flaws in that initial investigation, and the circumstances surrounding it, I think the mystery around the death will probably continue to linger on. Sometimes in Okeechobee now, you see people long for the good old days, when things were simpler, better. Anytime a new store or a business opens up in town, you see a lot of old timers complaining that Okeechobee is losing its small town feel and it's going to hurt the mom and pop stores like we had back in the day. And when I hear that, I always think, well, half those mom and pop stores you remember from back in the day turned out to be money laundering fronts for drug smugglers. So, you know, maybe in comparison, it's not the end of the world that Wawa built a new convenience store. I think we'll be okay. So where does this all bring us? The war on drugs. Billions of dollars, smuggling rings, murders. Well, despite spending over a trillion dollars to enforce the war on drugs since 1971, according to data from the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, the number of illicit drug users rose to 13% of Americans in 2019, nearly reaching its peak from 40 years ago. So after trillions of dollars, a massive amount of rest and crackdowns, we're right back to where we started, when the war on drugs began. A few
you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing. And you are currently incarcerated in federal prison, is that accurate? That's correct, sir. Okay. And what are you serving time for? Uh, importation. Of? Uh, cocaine. You want to name where you took them to? Well, uh, Gainesville, uh, Southern Florida near Okeechobee.